so today's topic is kubernetes so do you know girish abhishek do you know about uh, what is kubernetes why we use that okay so let me tell tell this so as definition says kubernetes or kts is an open source orchestration and cluster management for container based applications maintained by cloud native computing foundation so in previous lecture we talked about docker so docker is nothing but containerization tools like you can containerize your application and you can run it anywhere uh, where docker runtime engine supports uh, but today nowadays now each and every os is now supporting that docker runtime engine so you can easily uh, deploy your application irrespective of irrespective of any os so so what is difference between doc containerization and containerization of container orchestration tool so so containerization is just like you are containerizing your application uh, and you are deploying somewhere and you are running it that's it but when it comes to high availability uh, when it comes to uh, it should be auto scale descale with respect to load uh, it should have a hot auto healing uh, capacity and there are so many features and basically if you want to orchestrate that particular container uh, like right now you want you are having only one replica now you want uh, there you now you want multiple replicas of your container to uh, procure the load and as well to distribute the load and to make it high level so in that case definitely we will be needing some orchestration tools so kubernetes uh, is one of famous tool i would say that that is used to orchestrate uh your container there is another tool as well there that is docker swarm if you see on internet you will find same thing it does but kubernetes has more uh functionalities more features and it is very easy to handle so that is the reason kubernetes is nowadays uh, so much famous in our devops world so main purpose of kubernetes is to manage container deployments so at present all applications are adapting microservice based architecture or monolithic architecture so in our uh, previous section that is of aws there we talked about microservice based and monolithic application so when we think of monolithic means there will be multiple services will be running uh, into one uh, server only so nowadays uh, to make it more usable and more readable so what we do like we are now following microservice based architecture where let's suppose we have one uh, application called facebook so facebook will have a multiple function like one is uh, notification service then then your chat service then there are some autobots uh, there that interacts with you uh, then your ui like how ui will be designed for your particular user so these are separate separate services so we can we can distinguish we can break them into multiple mini services like one will be notification one will be uh, uh, and so on so to do that microservice based architecture what we will do like we will uh, so the best way is to have a docker container we will uh, deploy all those uh, microservices in 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 the docker containers and and each microservice will run separately with the help of docker and and we can orchestrate that thing with the help of kubernetes so that is the reason uh, kubernetes is getting more famous and getting more popular because it it it's perfectly supports that microservice based architecture and and it removes a lot of complexities uh, in terms of network and so many things we will discuss about those things as well so so it is a way to approach microservice based architecture through containerization technology so we already talk about that right so as we know docker revolutionized container technology all the developers are using containers to build their application so to manage those containers at a large scale we use kubernetes so docker is revolutionary technology definitely uh, because it made developers work easy like they just have to develop their code made make a dev, 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 docker file just directly deployed anywhere they want they need to know worry about what os they are going to use they just have to that's the thing there should be a docker runtime engine right so it it is a revolutionary thing because of that we were able to use 
almost all our resources of uh, because earlier what used to happen like we used to have a machine in that we'll have one application we don't know how much it is going to be used so it so it will never be like it will be 90 for 95% resources will be used so definitely it will be a waste of resources and everything so so it so all these things are uh, vanished because of docker containerization and so that is the reason kubernetes came in and you might know like kubernetes is also was originally designed by google only and now we are maintaining it through cloud native computing foundation there is one foundation that is cncf so they managing the kubernetes okay so why we need uh, Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is used to automating the deployment, scaling, and management of your containerized application. So it provides an open source platform for orchestration and automation of containerized workloads and services. So now you know, like, to manage your containerized application, uh, to automate their deployment, scaling that is auto scaling, upscale, descale, and also management. So, so to do that, uh, Kubernetes is open source platform we have, which orchestrates everything for us. Okay, so Kubernetes also allows for easy scaling of your application, self-filling, rolling updates, so making it well suited for running microservices and distributed system. So because of easy scaling of your applications, self-filling, like if your pod goes down, automatically Kubernetes will take care of that. It will try to make that pod up and running. We will talk about that thing, like how it does through Kubernetes architecture in our next slide. So that is the thing. We can do rolling update like uh instead of updating all pods we can have a uh, current version of code in one of our docker container and another docker container will be spinned up which will have a newer code and we will test it once that is test when test is done uh we will wipe out our uh, older pod so this is how we can do rolling update so there are two cases i would like to discuss like why we need kubernetes one is container deployment so container deployment so let's say you have a couple of java applications right and you can package into a container and run it on server containing a docker engine or any container engine okay so for this scenario there is no complexity like what you are trying to do like you are packaging the java application and you have one server where your docker runtime engine is installed and you are directly uh, deploying that docker uh, image over there so there won't be any uh, complexity and you will be exposing port uh, for the docker container to access it from your outside world okay so so just think like it will be a downside as well like uh, you are running a single application somewhere on your server with the help of docker runtime so definitely you might be running only single pod of single container of that so there will be definitely a uh, chance to have a single point of failure so that it is only running on single server so okay so downside what i'm telling downside will be the single point of failure as it is only running on a single server so to so handle single point of failure you will need a efficient mechanism so that efficient mechanism you will get it from kubernetes only so where you will be deploying your container in the form of pods one of the resource the kubernetes is having and rest kubernetes will take care of that like if that pod container goes down uh, Kubernetes will automatically make that pod up and running. That is one of feature called auto healing. Uh, I would say in Kubernetes. So that is the why you need container clustering. That is why you need container clustering and orchestration tool to avoid that single point of failure. Like simply using container tool doesn't make sense. But if you have orchestration tools, so definitely it will add a lot of uh, flexibilities and functionalities to uh, your microservice based architecture okay not microservice but any application and the second we are already talking a lot about that is microservice deployment and orchestration that is another reason we will need a kubernetes so so again take an example like we have a big application we already talk about that which will have a uh, multiple microservice like apis will be there ui user management uh we talk about facebook right so we'll have a notification service and so on so all these microservice components have to talk to each other using some rest api 
or other protocols right definitely those microservices will be talked within each other so uh, as the application has many components or microservices so we cannot deploy all the services in one server or in one container okay so what we have done like we have a, a big application we have bro broken down into multiple microservices so now we can't uh, deploy all the services into one container on or on the one server so definitely uh, we'll have to decouple our application and each microservice should be deployed separately and it should be scaled on its own like according to the load on that particular microservice we will get it okay so this is again like your application deployment will be also easier because you are going to use microservice based architecture so if you are only one of microservice getting load so uh, you can do uh, you can have auto scaling over there if you want to do changes for that particular part only for your big application so it is very easy to deploy things for that particular application only right so so now when we talk about microservice based architecture there are so many complexities uh i would say like networking then share file system uh, then load balancing then your service discovery like service discovery is nothing but one microservice should able to talk to another microservice right so there is here is the reason we are use kubernetes uh which helps us to orchestrate complex processes in manageable way i hope you are getting my point like why we need kubernetes Yes, okay. Now let's jump to Kubernetes architecture. Okay. Uh, let me zoom it. Okay. So whenever you so whenever you see kubernetes architecture so you will find two major components in you in your kubernetes one is control plane and another is worker node so control plane you can say it is a uh, main uh, part of your kubernetes cluster which drives all these activities like deploying kube deploying your container uh, making it up and running uh, auto healing auto discovery services then uh, upscaling descaling of your container so all these things are managed by your master node so and another one is worker node where actually your container will be deployed so uh, in master node there are several components are responsible for to do this activity uh, there is etcd then there is a control plane api server scheduler uh, sorry control not a control plane control plane is, is main thing like one master node is uh, defined as control plane and control plane have a uh, components like etcd api server scheduler and control manager okay and in your worker node there will be a kubelet your container runtime that will be a docker and then your kubernetes services like your actual application running in the form of pods deployments so we will talk about those resources as well so this is the overall architecture uh, of your kubernetes okay so any doubt so far like we will go in depth now but any doubt in this no rahul okay so so whenever uh, when you think about kubernetes the first thing will be there are two major components one is control plane and another is worker node and in control plane there will be a four components resp responsible for to do all those activities and and our in worker node there will be uh, three three to four like kubelet container runtime there is a kube proxy and your actual pods uh, actual services are running okay so so uh, this is a generic architecture i would say like if you going for a microservice based architecture with the help of kubernetes so this you will be following like i have prepared uh, this particular architecture so definitely we will try to cover uh, all, all these components in our next session so we will be 
discussing about what exactly how we can use Kubernetes in our real time applications, how microservices are deployed. So these are several components like we will have a Kubernetes, which will have a master node worker node. There will be some several worker nodes. OK, then uh, uh, we will have a monitoring solution place like this Prometheus and uh, Elastic Stack uh, to monitor our cluster plus our uh, application logs. Then we'll have a databases uh, we'll be requiring for our application. We'll have a Kafka cluster as well, and we will have a Docker register as well, like from where we will be pulling all our images. OK, and we'll have a load balancer that will be in a public network from there the, that will be single entry point to access our application. We will have an NFS as well, like to have a shared file system where uh, multiple services can use a common data uh, store in our NFS. So definitely we will go uh, in a deep for this particular architecture and we will talk about talk about this in our next session. So OK, so let's uh, so in a control plane, uh, there are four major components. One is control manager, scheduler, etc and API server in worker nodes. You will found uh, three major uh, components. One is kubelet. Q proxy uh, and Docker runtime. So we will talk about each and every component one by one. So first is API server. So so API server like with it name itself tells you what is API server. So definitely if you think uh, in a lemon perspective, definitely it's kind of server where it is exposing some APIs, right? Some rest APIs that will be used to carry out all those uh, operations in your Kubernetes. OK, so same the cube API server is the central hub uh, of your Kubernetes cluster that exposes Kubernetes API. So end users and other cluster components can talk to the cluster via that API server only. So if you want to uh, deploy anything in a cluster, if there are several components, right? We we are talking about microservice based architecture. So, so these microservices will be communicate to each other. So to, to have that communication, uh, API server will be responsible because those components also will be using your API, APIs, Kubernetes APIs only that are stored in your API server. So now you know like why we need. So API server, we can think like it's one of the important part of your KTS cluster, which, which exposes all KTS related APIs that will be used to perform uh, that will be used to orchestrate your container uh, plus the cluster layer operations as well. Any doubt in API server? No, no. Um, so next company is it etcd so so you can think like etcd so uh, okay so uh when when we talk about etcd uh, we can think is like it will be a database uh, for your kubernetes cluster okay any application uh, like we talk about three tier architecture in our previous sessions right like three tier architecture nothing but you will have a front end back end front end middleware and your back end okay in front end there will be ui in middleware there will be some back end services and in uh, not a back end services in middleware there will be APIs, right? And in backend, there will be a database. So you can think same in a Kubernetes as well. Like this is also three tier based architecture, I would say. Like front end, uh, where you are able to do all those uh, operations, like you are able to orchestrate, you are able to deploy anything with the help of uh, some uh, one of the tools that is kubectl, is the uh, kubectl is a tool which we use to. Uh, interact with our Kube, uh, Kubernetes cluster. We will see kubectl how to install kubectl 
but we can think that is as a front end and our terminal as a front end as well from where we are trying to uh, deploy our things uh, then your kube api server will be your middleware where rest apis are placed that rest apis will be used to perform all the operations right and the back end will be your etcd which will be a database for your uh, kubernetes okay so in kubernetes so so now you know like uh, etcd is nothing but your uh, database i would say like so it is a back end service discovery and database so uh, and if you look into etcd now so it stores all data in the form of key value pair uh, so we can think like etcd is a brain of your cluster where it stores all deployments all uh, kts objects you have done you have deployed in your uh, kts cluster let's think like if you are if you have deployed nginx in the kts cluster so you will have some in, for that nginx you will be having some uh, uh resource kind you have you must have like pod deployment we will talk about that as well so so that particular uh thing now kubernetes low this is the nginx pod running and for uh, so that particular metadata for that nginx pod will be stored in etcd so so whenever uh uh something happens with our nginx uh, pod like we talk about auto healing functionality of kubernetes so auto healing nothing but if something happens to your nginx pod like if it goes down so kubernetes easily able to uh, find a state of that particular nginx pod because that's stored in your etcd only your states of your containers are stored in your etcd only uh, metadata about that particular container is also stored in etcd only so whenever that container goes down kubernetes make api call to etcd get the state uh, from the etcd and try to schedule that pod again uh, on your workload node like make it make it up and running again and again save that state to etcd so this is how etcd we can see it see it as a brain of your uh, kubernetes cluster so it is very crucial component i would say like if it goes down your all data will be wiped out so you will have to take care of your etcd in any cause i would say any doubt in etcd no ra okay so now we talked about kube api server we talked about Uh, schedule uh, sorry etcd now the third component is scheduler cube scheduler okay so uh, let me just walk you through uh, how you request kubernetes cluster to create one pod right so let's not worry about what is pod uh, just think like you want to deploy one container in your kubernetes cluster you want to run nginx let's think like you want to run nginx so you will be requesting kubernetes cluster see this is a nginx i want to run it as a container in your cluster so that request will go to your kube api server why it is will go to kube api server because we now know kube api server is responsible for all those rest apis those are grpc calls so where we will uh, uh where we will order Kubernetes cluster to install that particular Nginx container. So this will be the first step. Like from kubectl is one of outside uh, command tool you use to interact with your Kubernetes. So from kubectl we will uh, ask Kubernetes to create one pod for us, create a Nginx container for us. So that request will goes to your Kube API server. Okay. So once that is goes to your Kube API server, what we will do? Like it will try to Uh, your kube api server will be connected to etcd so so now you have given one template like this will be the template of your nginx container see this is you want to install so that metadata that template uh, will be stored in your etcd first so the first state of your container will be it is going to be deployed okay so that will save the state so once that is done uh, so once that is done it will uh, acknowledge back to our kubectl yeah we have started uh, in started 
operation to create that particular nginx container in our kubernetes cluster so that request acknowledgement will go back to kubectl so that is done from our front end side now inside what will happen so once uh, you requested for nginx container to kube api server kube api server will store the template of it template of that nginx container in the etcd first uh, and then uh, and then again it will uh, kube api server will acknowledge uh, acknowledge back to uh, end user that particular request is uh, started serving so once that is done now what will happen now kube scheduler it is responsible for scheduling your scheduling of your containers in your worker nodes now we know like we were use worker nodes to deploy to deploy our actual containers master node is just for to manage and to maintain all the cluster level activities right so what kube scheduler does like kube scheduler continuously hit to kube api server like it try to check whether any pod uh, to be deployed whether any uh, pod is restarted uh is try to check state for each and every container so what you will do like kube scheduler will see there is one unassigned pod uh, like uh, we requested for nginx container right to kube api server and it saved state that that is still unassigned okay so like it initialized initiated uh, the container creation procedure okay so so the uh, so the process between that container creation process in that that particular container will be on assign like uh, kubernetes will see where that particular container should be deployed in our worker nodes okay so scheduler will see that on assign pod that is nothing but container and will try to create pod node binding pod node binding nothing but it will look for one of worker node like if you see master uh, kubernetes cluster now there will be a several worker nodes running so kube scheduler will try to see if uh, which worker node will able to accommodate that particular nginx container so scheduler sees that unsigned pod and creates a pod node binding pod node binding means it allocates one of the node one of the worker node from cluster for that pod so once that is done again kube api server will save that state then now the next what is the next state first state was unassigned state now next stage is it have that particular container has assigned some node right worker node so this is the fifth operation has been done now next once that stage is done so kube api server will initiate to bound that particular container on that particular node so you can see from sixth operation this is going to here in your worker node okay so we will talk about kubelet uh, but let me tell you like kubelet is responsible for to kubelet is actually responsible for on that worker node to uh, deploy that container using that container runtime okay so kube api server uh, and so there will be uh, if you have a five worker nodes no so on each worker node you will find kubelet service running so each worker node have its own kubelet so what will do like kube api server will uh, talk to kubelet like see this pod is now assigned to this node and now try to uh, deploy it as a container on that worker node okay so so that call will go to this okay okay and same uh, then again kube api server will send that pod data set like that container data set uh, to kubelet to let the data set is nothing but a template like how many replica you want how many resources you want that particular template we will talk about that template as well, like how template looks like looks like and that will be uh, sent to kubelet and then kubelet will start that container on your container runtime in the form of pods okay so once that is done uh, okay so once that is done your pod will start as uh, your container will start running on that worker node uh, your container uh, will be bounded bound to that node that is a nine step and again uh, it will save the again kube api server will save the state of that particular container yeah th now that container is up and running so this is the life cycle will be running in a loop uh for that particular container like now it is in running state now something happens to that container it went into uh, restart mode or went into something again uh kubelet will send that data to kube api server kube api server will check the uh, previous state like uh, now the state is uh, restarted or something happened like it is broken again kube scheduler will try to make that uh, particular uh, pod up and running in kubelet so this is how 
cube uh, scheduler helps you to schedule your container. That container is nothing but your pod on your worker nodes. Any doubt so far uh, in this? No, no. No, no. Okay, so definitely in interview, anyone we will ask you about these things only like how scheduler works. So you should know all these things like uh, so cube API server, cube scheduler, and ATCDR works. Uh, all three components work together. Not just, but we are now going to talk about controllers as well. So all these four components to make your container or a pod up and running, all these four services are uh, components are responsible like cube API server, cube scheduler, ATCD controller. Okay, so now we know what cube scheduler is. Try to schedule that particular pod on your worker node or through all these operations. Okay. Now the next is controllers. So, so why controllers are responsible? So we completed one life cycle, right? Uh, means uh, we requested for one pod creation, uh, then QBPI servers saved us that into ETCD that is that is unassigned. Then Cube Scheduler uh, uh, communicated with QBPI server and sees one of the unassigned pod. Uh, then again, Cube API server uh, saves the state. Then cube scheduler uh, start bounding that particular unassigned port to some particular worker node. Again, that save will be stored. Uh, uh, save will be that that state will be saved in your ETCD. Uh, then once that is done, then cube API server will make a call to your kubelet uh, with all necessary things it requires to run that particular unassigned port as a container. That is the template will be given to kubelet, and then kubelet will start that container. Uh, and and this will be in a continuous fashion okay so if so controller comes in so there are so many controllers available node controller pod controller service controller job controller for each and every object in kubernetes there are controller controllers now if we let's take example like if we have requested for a pod creation that is engine is container creation so that controller controller will be responsible to to keep that nginx container up and running so controller will continuously check the the state of of your nginx container in a kubelet through kube api server if it is running then okay but if it, if there are other states then running like om that is out of memory if it is restarted so controller will try to uh, keep your nginx containers desired state that is running uh, by doing all operations again, like if controller finds that particular engine export is not running, it is having some other state like it is restarted or it is having OM kill. So controller will again make a call to your API server and then uh, then API server will check the state of uh, your, what I say, your container in ETCD that is in, that is in not that is not in running state. Uh, then again, for, then cube scheduler will try to uh, schedule that pod. Uh, like then cube, cube scheduler will come in picture and it will try to uh, make that pod up and running. So this is how controllers are responsible for to uh, keep the desired state of your pods. Desired state is nothing but your services will be should be up and running all the time. So this is how it gives you auto healing feature from your kubernetes now you understand like what we are why we are trying to say auto healing so because of controllers only when we see like uh, trying to keep a desired state like trying to keep your nginx content up and running so so whenever anything happens to that nginx uh, if it is restarted so controller will uh, will be responsible to get that nginx back to running uh, back to desired state that is to running state any doubt in controllers cube scheduler dcd cube api server no no okay. so now you i hope you understood the uh, not a basic i would say but the working of each and every component from your master node side right Okay.
so there are several uh, controllers are available like pod controller deployment controller job controller name switches controller whatever i'm trying to select pod deployments are uh, kubernetes objects uh, we i will list down all those objects like uh, but it's on our use like what should be used like there is a deployment controller then replica set controller daemon set controller job controller cron job controller endpoints controller name switch controller service accounts controller node controller even if something happens to your no worker node again controllers are responsible for to make that uh, node up and running uh, worker node like uh, whenever you will try to uh, create a cluster node so you will see some master nodes and some worker nodes to kubectl get nodes command so in that you will find worker nodes so you, so if the state of those worker nodes also is not other than running so definitely controllers will try to uh, make that nodes up and running again will try to do all operations so it's kubernetes does not uh, just not auto heals our microservices which we are going to deploy but it auto heals itself as we try it tries to itself auto heal itself as like something happens so it's one of the component it tries to auto heal itself right in a ekdam in a uh, very extreme cases only we will have to debug those things we will have to sort on our own but but on a primary basis it tries to auto heal itself as well through controllers okay now we are done with our control plane we are done with controllers kube api server etc and kube scheduler now the let's talk about this worker node part like we we discuss like there are three component major components one is kubelet uh, container runtime and kube proxy i didn't mention it over here but kube proxy is the component okay so kubelet is the agent component that runs on every node like i already said this word like uh, if you have five worker nodes on each worker node you will be saying kubelet is running okay and it doesn't run as a container it's a command line uh, executable i would say that will be running directly on your worker node but if you see these components now this will not be running as a uh, this will be not running on your worker nodes on your uh, vms that where the master node is deployed this will be running this all will be running in the form of uh, docker images only in the form of containers only so that is the uh, flexibility kubernetes has given like they have isolated their components as well from uh, outside os right you now you can think like kube api server will be running as a container only but still it will do a lot of things for you uh, within your cluster but kubelet will not be running as a container it will be running directly as a command line on your vm only but it is responsible for registering worker nodes uh so whenever you will be uh try to create a cluster no when you create a master node uh, you will have to register your vm as a worker node to that master node so in that case kubelet will be responsible for to have that communication with master node and it will register that particular vm as a worker node under that master node so that is one of the responsibility i would say of a kubelet okay next is uh as we request for some container creation uh, right so kube api server will communicate with kubelet it will send all pod related template and kubelet will be responsible for to running that particular uh, nginx or some application as a container on that worker node so so the second uh, uh, so second work of kubelet is to uh run your application as a container okay now the third is now we talked about controller right so whenever anything happens to uh that particular pod if it is other than running state so not just controllers kube scheduler and api server are responsible but kubelet is also responsible over there like to because at the end that particular execution will be done at worker node only so kubelet will be the responsible uh to make that particular nginx pod or to make that container up and running again by redeploying it by doing some another thing okay so these are the three uh, so 
so whoever ask you what is what kubelet does so kubelet is responsible for uh, running your uh, pod as a container on the worker node okay in a diagram itself you are able to select kubelet start container on a container runtime okay uh, any doubt in kubelet nora okay now the next is container runtime so we discuss about docker uh, containerization tools uh, docker is widely popular because it it, it enables enables you to containerize your application and run it anywhere if there if there is a container runtime uh, installed on that machine okay so kubernetes does not do containerization it orchestrates so at the end it also uses some docker it uses docker only like container runtime only uh, to deploy that particular uh, application as a container right so in that case you will be needing some container runtime to be installed uh, on your worker node uh, docker not on work not just on worker node but on your master nodes as well like as we talk about like cube api server etcd cube scheduler and controllers are also running as a container only so there will be also running container runtime on your master node and to deploy your actual application for that also you will be needing container runtime so container runtime will be uh, installed on your kubernetes so on your kubernetes nodes so whenever kubelet uh, gets order to uh, run any application as a container it communicates to that underlying container runtime installed on that worker node and tries to deploy that container over there okay so this is why we use container runtime um the third component is kube proxy so so we are uh, rigorously talking about uh, microservices architecture in that we'll have a big application uh, broken down into multiple microservices uh, and so in that case we'll have to enable communication between all those microservices then only our big application will, will be running so to enable that communication between microservices now think like in you in a kubernetes you are trying to deploy a big application in form of microservices those microservices are nothing but running as a pod that pod is nothing but your container so there will be several containers running for your big application uh, now you want to communicate now you want to have a communication between all those containers so there kube proxy will be responsible for to enable communication uh, between all those containers microservices container slash microservices right uh, so okay so to so i would say like uh, so let's think like how you will be using kube proxy okay uh, let's think like let's suppose there are two Uh, services are running like you have java application it is having one ui and it is having one backend okay now ui you will have you will be exposing you will be accessing ui on internet and that backend service then then ui will make a call to your backend service right so to have that communication there will be a queue proxy now we are talking about pods deployments daemon sets replica sets right so in queue proxy you will be getting you will be seeing two resources they use one is services and one is one is endpoint so what does what services does like it creates one it is a object again in kubernetes uh, instead of like definitely an in interview interview will ask you this question like uh, let's suppose uh, you have installed two pods in your kubernetes okay uh, so let me uh, Uh, reiterate uh, with another thing let me clear one uh, another thing like uh, in kubernetes like you might be seeing like uh, whenever you try to run uh, docker uh, on your machine right so definitely it will be by, bound to some ip like it will bound to your local host and it will, it will have some port right to access that particular uh, docker container on your machine like so same happens in kubernetes as well like containers will have some ips and will have some port okay uh, that ips will be 
coming from your CIDR, right? Let's suppose you have uh, now you are installing your Kubernetes on some data center on in AWS. Then you will have one VPC. We already talk about VPC because as it is creates a network layer for your architecture. In a VPC, we get one CIDR like 10.0.0. CIDR nothing but a pool of IPs, I would say. Uh, and that pool of IPs will be used uh, to uh, identify your container on the basis of IP. So each container will have a unique IP address. I can see, see you here like CNI 10.0.2.5. So each container will have a unique IP uh, because it will get it from a CIDR, like whatever we have given it, like 10.0.0.16. Like 10.0.0.16 is nothing but it's a kind of big IP pool, I would say. So around 8,000, not 8,000, uh, 8, uh, 8, 3, 3. Around 50, around 48,000, uh, around uh, 48,000, I would say there will, that much IPs will be, that much IPs will be in your 10.0.0 slash 16. I will have to, but that will, but that will, that will be, that will be bigger in a size. So each container will be allocated a, unique IP address. Okay, so now you know you have ultimately you are running your application as a container only. Kubernetes is just extra layer on that container which will orchestrate that container, right? So container will have a unique IP and you know like whenever container goes down and then second condition will be whenever container will go down and if you make it up and running, same IP will be not be there for that container. There will be another IP from your IP pool. Okay, so that that is done through your CNI, that is container network interface. So CNI is one of the uh, adjoining uh, component. We have it in a, a Kubernetes that is responsible for to allocate IPs to your container from Kubernetes. Okay, so there are so many available like Flannel is there, Vivnet is there, Calico is there. Uh, so those CNI are used and CNI works together with your Kube proxy. So now, Let's back come back to our interview question, like where you interviewer will ask you. Uh, let's suppose two pods are running. Now you know that two pods are nothing but two containers are running, and will and the containers will have a unique IP. One will have a 10.0.2.5, another will have a 10.0.2.6. One is your backend, and uh, another container is your database. Uh, now, in general term, how you will be connecting it? Definitely, you will be using that IP only to communicate with that with your database like one pod will be able to communicate with other using the database uh, using that ip only like 10.0.2.5 will connect to 10.0.2.6 okay and now we'll ask like what if like it uh, the data database pod goes down so there definitely the ip will change so every time you will be doing changes in your uh, code like now this was the ip of database that 10.0.2.6 now it is 10.0.2.7 so to avoid that, there is a queue proxy comes in. Queue proxies give gives you two objects. One is services and one is uh, endpoint. I will show you like how service object look like in a later part of sli our slide. Just imagine. So you will have one pod. Uh, in that will will have a container. It will have some unique IP. So because of queue proxy, you don't need to uh, identify your pods on the basis of IPs. You will have one service object that will be bound to uh, think service object like 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 uh, on the internet. If you whenever you hit google.com, www.google.com, it's very easy to remember, right? And if you go with 4.4.4 .4 .4 and 8.8.8, .8 .8, this is again the IP of Google only, right? You can hit to Google in either way, but what is most easiest way? Uh, to do that is www.google.com because it, it is very easy. You don't need to worry about which IP is right now having to that Google website, right? So same services does for you. You will have a some unique naming convention for your pod. Like let's suppose you are running Mongo pod, your service object will be Mongo. So on the basis of that Mongo name, you will be able to connect your database that is running in Mongo pod. So this is how QProxy helps you uh to have a communication between pods and definitely interviewer will ask you this question like what we will do like in case of if that pod ip is getting changed because of uh downtime so your answer should be we'll be using service object 
to identify our ports not on the IP address base. Uh, we'll be using service object, so we'll have a unique name for our service, and that service will be bound to our port uh, with some selectors and labels. So on that labels, we will able to connect with our port. So we will uh, talk about labels as like how, what are the labels and what are selectors. But this is the terminology behind Q proxy. Any doubt in Q proxy? Not on. Okay. So I already discussed about Q proxy, but this is the uh, thing I'm trying to say. Like, um, so you can now understand like each pod is having a uh, separate IP uh 170 dot and that coming that particular ip is coming from your ip table ip table is nothing but your cidr only from there it is only it is coming and group proxy is responsible for uh like translation rules like we in a, in, in very generic term we said like we'll be using service object so in backend it is transparent to all. it it is what it does like on the basis of labels it tries to translate that particular uh, service name you given into IP only in backend. That's the thing we don't need to worry about uh, what exactly it is doing. So Q proxy maintains the cluster IP uh, pod IP translation rules based on the control plane information. Pod IP translation rules. Pod IP translation rules are nothing but your service object only. In that you will be giving this will be service object. This will be bound to your pod and Q proxy will be responsible for the translating uh that service name into your ip in a backend so so even if i change it will automatically translate it so that is the reason uh if you see our websites we never use uh ips we use some unique domain name only like triple www.google.com triple www.instagram.com in backend there are ips and those are uh translated using our dns servers uh, right so this is the common thing they have used uh, in a Kubernetes as well. Now you understand like how Q proxy works. Okay. Uh, now let's let me just walk you through. So this is how uh, template looks like. Whenever you request request for Nginx application, you will be applying this template via Kube Settle to your cluster. Now you can visualize everything, like whatever we discussed so far, like how request goes to your Kubernetes, uh, uh, how it Kube uh, API server uh, stores the metadata, nothing but a template again plus state of your uh, Nginx in the etcd. Uh, then cube cube scheduler scheduler continuously try to fetch try to check with cube API server which pod is unassigned then it will check for the nginx state is nginx pod is unassigned then then it calls make a call to cube API server and cube API server make a call to kubelet uh, and gives the template whatever template we have that is stored in nginx that is stored in etcd it is passed to kubelet and they, with the help of this kubelet with the help of this template kubelet uh starts running container on the worker node that nginx now you understood uh, i hope you understood like any doubt you can ask hello rahul uh, can you repeat one thing yeah then this template yeah so we like in our previous slide if you come here uh, not here sorry where it is We request a request from some pod creation right here through our kubectl command. So we'll, I will show you like how kubectl looks like. So the request is nothing but your template. You are passing this template like you are telling Kubernetes. See, this is the template I want to uh, deploy in your Kubernetes cluster and I want to run an Nginx container over there. So that request will go to your 
API server. Now you understood, right? What is the flow? Yes, yes, sir. Right? Then Cube API server. Then Cube API server. Not just save the state of your unassigned pod. Like it is the request is given, right? To your Cube API server, right? So that state will be stored. Like what is the initial state of your pod is? It is unassigned, right? It is to be deployed on some pod, right? So let's think like the state will be unassigned. The state will be stored to etcd, not the state, but the template. This template will also be stored to uh, your etcd, right? And that is the reason uh, controller able to uh, keep the desired state of your container because how controller will get to know like which template it has to use, right? The template will be also in st uh, stored into your etcd only. That is the reason etcd is crucial and it is a brain, I would say, of your Kubernetes cluster. It stores everything like metadata, template, state, and everything. On the basis of that, only control able to uh, keep the desired state of your pod in your worker node. Now you understood like chronology. Yes, sir. So when anyone asks you, this will be the flow only, right? how kubernetes works okay so let's go one by one like um, any doubt uh, do you want me to explain it again or shall i continue with this template like i will tell each and every line of this no no you can continue okay so so the first is api version uh, first part is API version app slash v1. So name itself tells you API version. So in Kubernetes, we are using uh, Kube API server. So in that all there are so many REST APIs. Okay, so apps v1 app slash version one is one of the API version we use from our Kube API server to work with deployment. So if you, you don't need to think about this uh, app slash v1. There are so many like if you I will recommend you guys to use uh, official document only Kubernetes official documentation only. So there will be fine like for deployment for pod for service object. Uh, for deployment pod uh, for demand sets we use app slash v1 only uh, for other things like if you go for uh, there are so many resources like cluster role binding service account. There are a different API version accordingly. We'll have to use that API version. OK, so now you know API version is nothing but app slash one like you can think like. Uh, if you work in one uh, uh, organization, definitely will have one swagger like where developers will. Uh, keep the data of of all their APIs, right? And then then we'll have some version versioning of your API v1, v2, v3, v4, right? So accordingly, you can use any of the like if you just give a app slash v1 slash particular rest api that v1 I will call app slash v2 that another rest api will call so same app slash v1 is responsible uh, is one of the version available it's in the api server and that is is used so it is widely being used app slash v1 only now next is kind so we are continuously talking about deployment demand set spots uh, service objects endpoint so that is nothing but the kind like if you are like now you know like pod will be the uh, let's talk about pod deployment demand set and state full set are the four kinds of cron jobs are the kinds we use to uh, install our application on the use case so first is pod so pod is single instance of your container running in your uh, kubernetes okay single instance like that ma container will be running okay uh, but in a pod, you want the pod is not uh, pod. Like why we don't the why we don't use pod because pod is not uh, that much mature to uh, con uh, to control itself. Like once we deploy pod, so it will be running. But there are deployment uh, demand sets that for so we widely use deployment for our application because we able to give replica. Like I want to. Uh, install four replica of my particular pod so i can mention over like replicas colon one replicas four like that so that is the reason we use deployment so deployment is one of the kind we used to deploy our application in a pod another one another kind is uh demon sets so think example like uh let's suppose uh 
I want one application like let's suppose I want uh, there are some log files available on all my worker nodes. OK, all worker nodes on all worker nodes. There is one log file. I want to uh, get that log file. Uh, I want to use that log file uh, for some outside operation like from log monitoring. Let's suppose so in that case I will be using daemon set. So deployment like if you the basic difference with de deployment and daemon set like if you even if you have a four replicas. So what it does like we know now like uh, scheduler checks. We there is one of the step of API uh, API uh, one of the scheduler one of the step of scheduler is to it checks uh, to which uh, node that pod should be bind right. So to which node pod should be bind is nothing but it checks for resources by whether there are resources available to accommodate that pod or not. OK, so in case of deployment, if one of the resources, uh, one of the node is having more resources and it is easily able to accommodate all those pods, all those pods, pods will be go going into that particular worker node only. But in case of log, but in case of our case, like there is a log file which is placed on each and every worker node and we want to get it from there. So we'll be using daemon sets. So what daemon sets does like uh, if you use kind daemon sets, that particular application will be deployed on each and every worker node uh, in your cluster. Uh, there you will be seeing, uh, seeing each, uh, each replica will be running on your, your, if you have four worker nodes, there will be a four replica of that particular application with the help of daemon set. If you increase the number of worker nodes, automatically daemon set will deploy that pod on that worker node as well to get the things from there. So this is the difference. Uh, stateful set like we use if you want to maintain our uh, state of our application like uh, in deployments uh, in a pods. What if you think about pods deployment also can we can make it uh, uh, so now the difference between deployment and stateful set. So deployments are stateless like we can use some volume in a backend to store our data. But next time if you delete that deployment now, so that PVC will, that volume will also get deleted. In that case, you will lose everything. So so to avoid that, like if you want to uh, in with respect to the application, uh, that won't affect. But if you are going to deploy database inside cluster, so, so database, the data will be crucial for us. So, so that should be maintained in any case. So in that case, we can use that full sets where uh, same volume will be used uh, every time, even if your pod goes down because of some uh, issue, like it get restarted, it won't get another volume or it won't use another volume. It will directly mount to that previous volume only where the data is stored. So these are the kinds like deployment, uh, stateful set, daemon sets, cron jobs. Like in a Linux, we set a cron jobs, right? Uh, that particular job should be run within the specific period of time. Yeah, so, in a specific period of time, uh, we schedule the job. Sorry, sorry, Girish. Like uh, I am saying, cron jobs are used to schedule the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. So these are the different kinds. So uh, if we uh, see the kinds now, there is a bigger list. I would say. Uh, config maps are there, demon sets are there, deployments are there, events, endpoints, horizontal pod autoscalers, ingress, jobs, limit ranges, namespaces, uh, nodes, pods, persistent volume. So uh, now let's one of the thing like namespace. So in a cluster like uh, like let's suppose you want to use you want to install like you have an application and there are environments for your application like prod, dev, and staging. And but you want to definitely for prod there will be a separate uh, cluster. But for your non-prod environments, you won't you don't want to create a separate cluster. You want to have a uh, single cluster only to be used. But the your services should be isolated <coughs> from each and uh, from each another. So for that you can use namespace. So we can create a namespace, and inside the namespace we can uh, deploy. Uh, that particular application here also you can see this is the nemesis where that deployment demo is there and in that our application will be installed when we do hands on no i will show you like how to create a nemesis and then we will try to deploy this particular uh, template in our uh, kubernetes cluster okay uh, so there are so many jobs so i would recommend you guys to uh, 
uh, follow uh, official document only to go through all those resources. Let me just walk you through again. Kubernetes. So this is the, you can see like they have given a very good documentation like Kubernetes cluster creation, then deploy app, close, explore your app, expose your app, scale up your app, update, update your app, not just thing like uh, in our case also, as we are bound to uh, cluster creation, they recommend you to use Minikube. So you can install it anywhere and you can play around with a Kubernetes objects. Okay. So workload resources are nothing but your deployments. Now you can see here. So it's very easy to learn these things through documentation itself only like. See, they have given an example as well. Like I have, I'm also going to use same example only, but still I wanted to show you like uh, in your free time, I would request you guys to uh, go through this document and do hands-on like for Kubernetes, it's not just a theory like uh, you will have to have a hands on on each and every resource. Maybe we, we are not may not cover everything in our single session, right? But still documentation is so good that uh, you will have to learn each and everything like how uh, each and every resource. not just this like these are the workload resources, then uh, you will be having services uh service objects storage classes configurations security policies scheduling preemption and eviction so these these things all things should be done uh like i will re request i will recommend you guys to go through this document and have a hands-on right in your free time okay uh Now the next part is this metadata. So metadata is nothing but like what will be the name of your uh, pod that will be given. These labels are crucial. Like when we come, when we talk about queue uh, uh, proxy and service discovery, so these labels are so crucial there. Like on the basis of this only service object able to distinguish which pod is there and it translates that particular name into exact IP in the backend. <laughs> okay. <coughs> And the namespace we already talk like to isolate your application from another uh, things like you can have a namespace. Okay. Now comes to specification specs. There will be some first part with the replica, uh, like how much replica you want for your pod that is container to deployment. So you can set it over here. Selector. Okay. Okay, so uh, selector. Now we uh, added label over here. So to match that, we we need a selector. Now, in uh, if you do not give selector, no, see so it won't run. Like we'll have to uh, give over there. Like because of this only, like these two components, the labels and selector. Then only in service uh, in your service object, you will be able to uh, what I say. You will able to identify which pod is to be uh, translated right here also you can see like we have given a selected object and in selected we have given an app colon nginx so what it does like its selector try to check within our ktest object which selector it is matching so it comes to here okay uh, sorry so it comes to here in the selector section uh, where it is okay uh, selector section now here it comes to like match labels app nginx and and then it comes to 
this particular label so this is how uh, the request flows right from your uh, outside internet to your actual pod i hope you are getting how so these are crucial uh things to be added in your template then only you will able to do service uh, service discovery any doubt in this no no okay uh next is container like what like this is the name of sorry so this is the name of your pod so inside also inside pod in pod is just the extra layer on your container now we know at the end container will be running on your machine right it's just a orchestration tools uh, orchestration tool to orchestrate your container right so you you can give a name of your container like nginx will be the name of my container that will be running that particular pod here you will have to mention the image you are going to use like i am directly given nginx so that will be downloaded from your docker hub if you have a docker uh, private docker registry you can mention that url as well over here uh, okay uh ports like which ports will be which port we will have to export that i have given 80 apart apart from that resources so how much resources it will be using like how much memory i want to give it to this pod like i have given 2 gb of memory and 1000 m that is nothing but one core of cpu you know right 1000 is nothing but one core uh and how much it will be requesting so this can be given okay now the next is service object we already talk about service object so service object is responsible for identifying your pod without uh, knowing the ip address right for that particular pod so same kind same so for the service there will be ip address in v1 kind will be service in metadata you will be having that label again we can give a uh, here also we can give a label but the main is selector on the basis of selector only it will able to identify the nginx pod in backend you can give a name to our service that nginx service we given that will be also deployed inside our namespace only here we'll be giving specs so if you go into service objects let me just show you that as well uh, <clears throat> so there are three types of services one is node port so if you set the type to type field to node port uh, here here sorry here type to node port then the kubernetes control plane allocates a port from range specified like in the case of node port default port range is 30000 to 32767 only from that only it will be assigning some port some port for that so node port like you can think like and now we know like that particular pod is going to be uh, deployed on some worker node only right so if you use a node port no so you will uh, and if you assign some port to that like i have assigned this 3050 so you will be running this port on that worker node so you can directly uh, with the with the help of that worker node ip and this port you can access your service so this is one of the uh, service type i would say like okay so it kind of gives you freedom to set up your own load balancing solution like you don't need to use any external load balancer or anything uh, right another there are there are two services again one is cluster ip and one is load balancer let me show. okay so cluster ip means uh, whatever so whenever you create a cluster no it assigns one ip to itself uh, so they will with the help of that ip also uh, you can access your services just to have to uh, let me tell you that okay i i will tell you
Yeah. So there are three cluster IP is default on node port, load balancer, and external name. So cluster IP it exposes the service on internal IP of your cluster. This type makes the service only reachable within the cluster only. So um, I will show you the I cluster IP of the cluster as well. Like I try to configure Minikube on my local to have a demo. Uh, so I will show you cluster IP. The node port we already discussed. Like same port of each selected node in the cluster. Okay, right. That but if you assign a node port, that port will be running on that worker node as well, and that through that also we can expose our services. Load balancer. We will create an external load balancer now. Now, if you see our architecture, the the architecture we design over here. So here you can see the load balancer added over here. So nothing but I am using external load balancer only. So I'm not using cluster IP or not using node port. I'm using external load balancer. Uh, so each service will have a external load balancer created in in that particular cloud or data center wherever it it supports. Like in AWS, definitely it supports you to create a service loss uh, load balancer for each service, uh, and that service will be exposed to internet. So. So these are the services. Okay, uh, external name maps the service to con contents of the external name. Like let's suppose you have a uh, some website. Let's take example like triple uh, w dot facebook dot com, and you want to use that website in your application. So instead of uh, directly giving that endpoint, you can create an endpoint for that service, uh, that particular domain, and you can use that as external name. Okay. So these are the services. So I would recommend you guys to walk through the documentation thoroughly. Then only you will come to know all these things. Like today, we are like we try to our architecture perspective, architecture uh, point of perspective. But in a depth, we'll have to go through document only. Any doubt so far? No, no. Okay. Or uh, now let's have a hands-on like uh like. If you want to do hands-on now, so itself Kubernetes uh, document like Kubernetes also recommend you to <clears throat> use Minikube only. So it can be set up like if we go for a cluster creation now, so it will incur a lot of cost like creating a master node which will having which should have a minimum two core four GB RAM machine. Then we'll have worker node. So to to while learning we should not incur a lot of cost right like if you get a aws account and you try to create vms and try to install cluster no so it will definitely gives you uh, a big size bill so as a beginner in a kubernetes you want to learn things you want to understand what what are the concepts so uh, what i say so kubernetes itself uh recommends you to use minikube so in a documentation only you will be seeing they have given a safe size well. like uh if we click on this hello minikube it will gives us like this is how we can use that so now we know like for a kubernetes cluster it requires docker like it's it's it the components of itself are using are running as a docker container only right api server uh, then other services are running as a docker container only so the first recommendation will be you should have a docker install on your machine okay so if you are having a windows machine uh, don't worry uh, just go on official site of uh, docker desktop here you will be finding uh, docker official website of docker and you will be finding install on windows so it will recommend you to install docker desktop for windows so once you install it you will be seeing screen like this so now you are uh, enabled docker on your local machine so this first condition is satisfied now next is you want to uh, what i say to uh, install minikube like uh, as a beginner if you want to uh, walk through kubernetes instead of creating a whole cluster uh, you can go with minikube it gives you a play around playground for for yourself to do all those activities so to that to do that we have a official minikube site so if you search for a minikube 
install minikubes on windows it will direct it will point you to the official website only that minikube.sijs.kts.io so just click on it and just follow the steps uh, on the basis of your operating system like i have windows so i followed the steps for windows only so it just ask us to uh, open a powershell as an administrator i open it i just ran these two commands and yeah my minikube uh, install on my uh, local machine okay uh you can see i can show you here so this is a powershell i have i had already done that because it takes a lot of time so i try to avoid within our lecture but those are very simple so you just have to copy and paste in your terminal right once that is done you just have to hit this command mini cube start once you do that so it will configure itself it will take some uh, three to four minutes uh, to configure mini cube that is nothing but kubernetes on your machine once that is done you are good to go uh, with use uh, with mini cube okay now the next is uh, like we talk about some cube ctl command right in our architecture over here this is a cube ctl so cube ctl is the executable to interact with your kubernetes right so we'll have to install that as well on your machine. So uh, that is also can be done uh, easily. So again, if you uh, search for install kubectl on Windows or any machine, it will redirect to your of to official document only kubernetes.io install and set kubectl. And here you can see the steps. I also followed the same steps only, and I installed it kubectl. Uh, so that is the reason now I'm able to. Uh, have the cube settle over here. Okay. Uh, now let's interact with our mini cube. Cube settle get nodes. See our control plane is ready. Like I have already installed it now, so I'm able to see that. Uh, in a mini cube, you won't see workout nodes. It will be, it will be using same. Uh, local machine only as to to deploy your pods uh, but in a actual scenario you will be seeing master nodes and worker nodes separate only and then we are talking about like the components uh, now let's see the namespaces so with the help of this only we can see all those namespaces okay so cube system is the default namespace to isolate its components from the application so if i do kubectl get Pods. I hope you are able to see my screen, right? Yes, Rahul. Uh, slide page zoom. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm, how I can zoom it? No problem, Rahul. No, no, no. Why do we do that? Now you are able to see, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. So cube settle get hyphen n cube system. So if you want to see the running application on pods from that particular namespace, this will be the command. Like first you will be doing cube settle get namespaces. Uh, then you will see how many namespaces are there. And if you want to see pods running inside of namespace, then you will have to give like command cube settle get pods hyphen and cube system. So here you can see cube API server control manager, your cube proxy, your cube scheduler are running as a NETCD are running as a Container only. Yeah, container. Now you understood, like uh, whatever we try to say in our previous slide, this is applicable over here. Okay, and uh, uh, the cube CTL cheat sheet is available on internet. Let me walk you through as well. Like if you being a DevOps and if you want to be an administrator in a Kubernetes, you will have to learn all these cheats, uh, all these commands. Uh, for a cube settle. So cube settle cheat sheet is available. So anything you want to do, you'll be doing from this only like applying manifest, like applying your template, uh, 
right? Uh, you want to describe your pod, you want to create a cron job, you will have to follow this cube sheet on cheat sheet only to do anything. So if you don't know, no, if you don't know this cheat sheet, no, definitely it will make your life hell uh, whenever it comes to Kubernetes administration. So being a DevOps and being a Kubernetes administrator, you should know all these things like uh, all those commands. So then only will be able to debug, will be able to perform operations on your Kubernetes. I hope you are getting what I'm trying to say. Okay. Uh, so, oh, something I did, sorry. So now I want to create a namespace, right? Now let's see, now what we'll do, we'll take a live example only from Kubernetes only. Uh, here we'll go. This one in Nginx application. Yeah, let me show you that cluster IP as well. Like if I hit uh, command, kubectl get, and what is the command kubectl get? Get, let me put all first. Yeah, so kubectl get, service command if I hit no so it will show me the uh, the cluster IP of my Kubernetes cluster so that also can be used uh, to access my services so let me just uh, try to deploy one engineer's application so here is the thing what we'll do like we'll try to deploy this application this nginx deployment uh so just copy just copied it i know we i will not work in powershell mm. okay so here see system 32 Windows. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Inside user, then inside this particular cell will go. Okay, now we are now we'll go inside desktop. Let's go inside documents. Okay, now I'll try to create one file over here in document. We can use Visual Studio again. Uh, to do that, Now I open everything. Sorry. Create one. Get a stud. Okay. 
now I will create one file over here. So uh, here also in KTS we use extension dot YML only. It is again yet another markup language. Uh, we will create this file over here. Something and let's install Kubernetes extension. OK, so we have installed Kubernetes cluster for better. Let's come back here only. It's happening. Could have write it directly. Now let's try to. Head to work on Windows. <laughs>
okay we have this now we will cube ctl apply hyphen f in this file name so to apply your yml you will have to use this uh, command cube ctl apply hyphen f so now if you do cube ctl get pods see your container started running so if you want to describe like what status is what is trying to do let's just copy this particular pod name then cube ctl describe pod and the container name and they enter see here you can see like default scheduler successfully assigned default engine container okay pulling image now right now it is trying to pull the kubelet is responsible for the running container so kubelet what will do it got the template and so now it is trying to fetch that image so here you can continuously check so see successfully pulled image created a container and started engine is container so if i do so kubectl get pods my containers are running 